here this evening, feel free to slip in. We're going to have an amazing time of worship. You know, uh, as I think about the uh, parable, the saying of Christ where he said, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The winds came, the storm came, blew that house down. But the wise man built his house upon the How many of you want to be wise today? I know I want to. I want to build my life. We want to build our lives on the true foundation, Jesus Christ, our cornerstone, the one who can protect us and keep us firm despite any storm that comes in life. And so would you stand with me? Let's sing together. God, help us to be our, you be our foundation. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Father, we come before your presence. You are our foundation. But the problem is, Lord, that we, we have put self on this highest seat, in the throne of our own hearts. And so, Lord, in your mercy, would you please, would you please forgive us? Forgive us for our sins, forgive us for our selfishness. And thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness and cleansing we can have in Jesus today. Father, there is no other name under heaven by which we are saved. And so we glorify the Lamb of God who sits on the throne of this world, of this universe. We turn our eyes toward Him today and we give Him glory 
We give him all adoration and praise. We bless your name above all names. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for that powerful, wonderful name. And Lord, may this song that we sing be one that brings you joy and it puts a smile on your face as we adore you in Jesus' name.
Get those biceps up. <laughs> <laughs> Nine weeks ago, uh, Dr. Dwight Nelson took to the ice on skates and ended up in the hospital. Screws now in his shoulder and in his hip. Yeah, hardware all over the place. Broke both places in multiple uh, pieces. Last week, Melanie and I took Mike and Kana to the ice on skates and skated alongside of them. Lesson that came to me, Pastor Dwight, when you're holding somebody's hand, it's harder to fall than when you're alone. And that's what Jesus was very clear about in the New Testament. Hey, come follow me, but follow me together so you can hold each other's hands. We call them... They're called all over the place, small groups or grow groups, growth groups. Here on this campus, we call them grow groups. The idea that as a community, we will, we will form small circles around common interests, crocheting, running, cycling, cooking, Bible study groups, but groups that together we can hold each other's hands and hold each other accountable and keep pointing each other to Jesus and, and the hope that we have and waiting for him to come soon. So that's what you just saw. An invitation to be part of a grow group in this community. They're all over, from, the, from, from Fort Collins all the way south through Longmont. There's little groups that are meeting at different times, and you're going to hear an appeal tonight. I'm telling you, these two nights that we've gathered together this week were for the purpose of appealing, for us to do heart-searching. God, what do I need to do? Where can I place myself so that I can be challenged and, and growing in you? What? What commitments, what decisions do you need me to make? And so this will be on the docket. This will be an invitation. What about joining a, a grow group, a small group of others to grow together, to hold each other accountable as brothers and sisters under the Father in heaven? Welcome tonight. We're glad you're here. It's, it's, it's just a real quick Wednesday, Thursday night, and then we call it good. Tonight... Again, when we leave, you will be challenged to make a decision, to search your heart, to hear what God is saying to you tonight. And then on the way out, there'll be refreshments, so leave slowly, get to know and communicate and celebrate with someone else. There's a kids program. If you're just wondering, sitting here thinking about it, there's a kids program down the hall. But, uh, and we do a drawing, Carol. We do a drawing, and you've got the basket. These are all of those who filled out the, uh, the drawing envelopes, and we're going to go back to the same place, all right? Let's just go to the bottom. Let's just forget about it. Somebody came early, and they're on the bottom. But I mixed them up. So you mixed them up. So this is Arthur Blood. Arthur Blood, you win the conflict, and he's all the way up top. It seems like there's a little bit of a trend there. All right. <clears throat> Last night, they were up top as well. Here's what I want to challenge you tonight, beloved. It's been said, it's been said that a dead Savior is good news, but a risen Savior is dangerous news. And that is that a Savior that's willing to die for us, that's a good news. That's, somebody was willing to take our place, but now he is resurrected. What do we do with a resurrected Christ? And what is he saying to us tonight? Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, tonight you've invited us into this space. Your house. We didn't invite you. You invited us. We have questions and doubts maybe. We've been searching. But tonight you want to meet us here with a word. Word of direction, a word of hope. So could it be that we come alive tonight having spent time with you? that you do a miracle in our hearts. Speak to us and grow us, change us, bring us to being alive again. In the name of Jesus, amen. So we had a chance, us pastoral team, to have a meal with Pastor Dwight this morning. And he quoted, he mentioned this text that I often quote, that I love. Zechariah 10.1, ask the Lord for rain in the time of the latter rain. 
The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. Did you notice? He doesn't promise us a drizzle. He makes flashing clouds and He gives us, He drenches us with rain. He drenches us with the Holy Spirit. And that, my friends, is the only way that we can come alive. And so as we sing this, may this be a prayer, a call out to God to give us His Spirit, to bring us back to life. God can fulfill that. Let's sing together. dry bones come alive. I love that song. Have you sung it a lot around here? It's new to me. What a powerful message. Amen. So we're taking the uh, shuttle bus to car rental, Denver Airport, yesterday. 
get on the shuttle bus, and automatically, as soon as that thing kicks into gear, the mayor of Denver welcomes you to this fine Mile High City where we have sunshine, he said, 300 days of the year. There ought to be a law against that. <laughs> there just ought to be. 300, 300 days of sunshine. And I'm driving up to the church, Karen and I, just a moment ago, and we get a text from one of our colleagues and friends. And the text says, and this is, the text says, he's, he's sending it from Michigan. If you, if you still can, don't come back. <laughs> Man, I'm telling you, when they tell you not to come back, you're in trouble. <laughs> oh, it'll warm up there. It's supposed to get up to 20 tomorrow. So that's the good news. Yep, it was minus 13 again this morning. But you know, I did have a privilege of meeting with your pastoral team here this morning for breakfast at, at Mimi's. We had a wonderful breakfast. But way more important than the breakfast was a time of real fellowship. I love your staff. You have a well-integrated staff here. I mean, the staff obviously has been carefully selected and, and, and appointed and anointed. And to be able to come just for two nights for something brand new called Come Alive and to, be, to have the honor of, of having a part in it. Thank you, Pastor Michael and team. Got to hang on to these guys. Don't let them go. They love you. I tell you what, boy, they love you. They said, this church, this church is really caught on and turned on to vision, Jesus' vision. So I'm proud of all of you and, and, and your staff. I want to pray with you. I want to segue right off of those words we just sang. Plunge into, plunge into the few moments we have together tonight. Oh, God, who cares what the temperature is? Wherever the Holy Spirit is hovering, it's warm. He's here. We sense it. We are grateful. On a Thursday night, he comes to a place like this. We thank you for these few moments as we relive a story let the story come alive, and may we see ourselves in it somewhere, please, so that we too might really come alive through Jesus our Lord. We pray. Amen. So Reuters News Agency was carrying this story out of Managua, Nicaragua. You know where Nicaragua is down in Central America. In, uh, what's the name of that uh, section of Managua? Uh, Tipitapa. Tipitapa. So uh, a man named Cesar Aguilera decides he needs to go visit his property. He has some property far away from Managua. And so without much ado, he simply disappears. 58 years old, Nicaraguan man. The first day, he didn't come back. His wife was a little concerned, but hey, a man can go and have a trip and then come back. Second day, more concerned. Third day, they're getting way more concerned. Fourth day, the wife is beginning to panic. Fifth day, she's in tears. Sixth day, seventh day, finally, they go to the morgue in Managua. And there among the cadavers, they spotted him. They cleaned the body, took it back to their suburb, and prepared for burial, for a funeral service. Two days later was the funeral service. The heartbroken family is gathered in that little funeral home. Cesar is in the casket. They have come to bid him farewell. And just as the service is beginning, the doors in the back explode open, and in comes walking bigger than life, Cesar himself. The place goes berserk. There's a, little, there's a little boy over in, the, over in the corner crying out, are you from this world or another? Well, you'd one of the same if the one in the casket comes walking through the door. Only upon closer examination, they found out it really is Cesar. He apologized. He was talking to a television reporter later. He, he said, I apologized to my wife that I forgot to mention to her that I was going to visit our property. 
And here she is just about to bury the body that is not Cesar. Although I imagine the thought did cross her mind, we ought to bury him too while we're at it. I mean, can you imagine being in a room where, this, where, where the one who is dead comes through the door? And that that's exactly what happened in the Gospel of Mark. We pick up the story tonight. We were, what were we reading? In John 19? We're in John 20 tonight. Two little, two little bookends to wrap up the fourth Gospel. But the, the, the upper room that goes berserk when the back door explodes open and in he comes. Come on, did you bring a Bible tonight? Open that Bible that you have. You got your phone? Pull your phone out. Find it. Doesn't matter how you read it. Just see those words in front of you. Let's put it up on the screen. Title for tonight, Requiem and Resurrection for a Fallen Brother. All right, you can just leave that title slide up. This is John, John chapter 20. Calvary, yes, last night. Tonight, resurrection. Oh, boy, and by the way, by the way, hey, hey Pastor Michael, Michael, you know what? That was a great line. That was a great line. Jesus, the Savior, dead, but he died for you. That's good news. But a resurrected Jesus, that's dangerous news. This is dangerous news tonight. Look at this. Verse 19. Gospel of John, chapter 20, verse 19. And on the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Yo, peace be to you. By the way, there, some people are always curious. They say, well, that must be the first Sunday worship service in all of Scripture. <laughs> There's not a word about a worship service going on there. The record is absolutely clear. They are gathered behind barred and shuttered doors for one solitary reason. They are absolutely certain that the bloodhounds that track their master to his death are on their trail, and they're next. They're hiding. It says, for fear of the authorities. The truth of the matter is that you can put all the master locks on the door that you want, but you can't lock the master out. <laughs> Boom! The doors just explode. A little boy in the corner probably screaming, are you from this world or from another? It's the Lord Jesus himself. And on the evening of the first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. In his language, he said, Shalom. Shalom. Gospel of Luke tells the same story. The place really does go berserk in the Gospel of Luke, and they are convinced it is a ghost, a spirit from the netherworld that has entered their midst. Jesus says, Psst, Stop. Peace. Shalom. Whenever he kicks the door open and he steps into your life with your permission, his first word always is peace. You don't have to be afraid. Shallow. Now, verse 20, after he had said this, because they're still not sure. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw. So they finally, they're sitting there staring, gaping. They finally see it in their minds, and they're overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, verse 21, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. I like the way you put it, Nestor, just a, just a, just a breathing, well, the song that we sang about, sang tonight, breathe on us. He breathed on them a little mini Pentecost. And he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone their sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And it just feels so weird because the story just ends right there. I mean, there's no closure. There's nothing. It just says, it just says, oh, by the way, if you forgive your, your uh, brother's sins, they're forgiven. If you don't forgive them, your, the brother's sins aren't forgiven. The end to be continued. Do you know what we've just witnessed? Those four verses, it's the birth of a resurrection community. Do you know why it's essential that we know that this is a resurrection com community? Because there have, been ten, there have been two deaths this one weekend, two deaths. The one everybody's been weeping over 
is alive and well. He's burst through the doors, but there has been a second death. You say, there's no other death. The only death that matters was the death of Jesus, and he was raised from the dead. Oh, no, 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 no. There was a second death. And in fact, he has died a thousand deaths over the weekend. And unless he is resurrected, the community will never be a resurrection community. Impossible. He said, I didn't know, but I didn't know anybody else died. Oh, you know. Of course you know. I want to read this from uh, the message translation. You know, Eugene Peterson, who uh, put the message together, composed the message. And by the way, in your reading through Scripture, it's okay to read a fresh translation. You don't have to receive every word of it as your favorite rendition of that verse, but by changing the translation. Uh, a couple summers ago, I read, I read the message through from stem to stern, and it, it, it'll just... It'll just revitalize your pictures that you have in your mind of those ancient stories. It's okay for your morning worship to just read something different. I want to read it the moment to you. You say, who died? I want to read it to you. Luke chapter 22. This is from uh, the message. Verse 54, arresting Jesus. This is early Friday morning. Arresting Jesus, they marched him off and took him into the house of the chief priest. Peter followed, but at a safe distance. In the middle of the courtyard, some people had started a fire and were sitting around it trying to keep warm. One of the servant maids, one of the servant maids sitting at the fire noticed him, then took a second look and said, yo, this man was with Jesus. He denied it. Woman, I don't even know him. And a short time later, someone else noticed him and said, you're one of them. And Peter denied it. Man, I am not. But about an hour later, Someone else spoke up really adamant. He's got to have been with him. He's got Galilean written all over him. And Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. And Matthew adds, he began to curse and swear to prove. And I'm one of those whips that followed Jesus in Nazareth. No, I'm not. Just then, that was one of the saddest heartbreakingest moments in all of Scripture. Just then, verse 61, the master turned and looked at Peter. The words hardly off his lips, a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered what the master had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and cried and cried and cried. Can you imagine the heartbreak? He's just turned the air blue with fishermen obscenities. I never knew that blankety blank, 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 blank man in my life. Cock a doodle doo. Eyes turn, eyes meet. He's died a thousand deaths all weekend long. And if he doesn't get resurrected, everything Jesus died for fails. Requiem for a fallen brother. You know what the word requiem means in Latin? It means rest. The question is, when a brother falls around here, when a sister falls around here, is there ever really any rest? Requiem for a fallen brother. <laughs> I send a birthday letter to every one of my church members. It's an honor to serve the Pioneer Memorial Church on the campus of Andrews University. And so when your birthday comes up, Three days, a week in advance, I'll get that letter. I'll be sitting on my desk. I'll grab a pen, and I'll just scribble something that you'll never be able to read, but it'll just say, well, at least he cared. <laughs> I'll do that with, with them, hundreds of them. <laughs> so I'm going through birthday letters the other day. And those I know, I do really do. I, do, I scribble down some, some word of uh, what we share in life together. And I, the next letter, right in front of me. And I look down and my heart stops. It's a letter to a man who under the cover of darkness practically slipped out of our community because of a terrible moral fall. And I'm embarrassed to tell you that when that letter went down next, 
I looked at that and I said, oh no. What am I going to say? Maybe I just, I just sign it. Dwight. Next. Maybe I just leave it blank like it somehow got past me and it got stuffed in an envelope and now he has an out of town address we had. Or what if I just drop this in the wastebasket? He'll never know. And we'll just go on. A requiem for a fallen brother. Is there any rest, really, if you fall in a community like this? A requiem, fallen brother. Am I my sister's keeper? Hmm? Requiem and resurrection. Because it is no coincidence that chapter 21 follows chapter 20. And Jesus has a resurrection to perform. The last in all the Gospels. So come on, go to 21. And everybody loves this story, and so do I. And if you're a fisherman, you really love this story. John 21, verse 1, And afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John boy, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. What you imagine that moment? What you think about Simon, our man Peter? It's a shining testimony to these boys to say, we're going with you. Because too many times when there's a fallen brother or a fallen sister fallen away, everybody steps away. We're not going with you. <laughs> We're not hanging with you. Bye-bye. Not a word, not a letter, not a phone call, not a visit. I say it's a shining tribute to these boys. Well, so the story's out. Everybody knows. He took his fisherman's dictionary of obscenities and pulled every word out of it and threw them all in the direction of Jesus. All the guys know. Everybody knows. You can't, you can't get more of a fall than to spit the name of Jesus out like a like a thrown away cigarette stub and grind it with your blaspheming heel into the earth and say, I never knew this guy in my life. You can't fall deeper than that, can you? In public? It wasn't like this was some private moment. It's a measure of their commitment to their colleague and brother that they say, no, no, no. We're going with you. Makes you wonder how long a Peter would last in this area. I mean, this little area in Colorado, this little faith community called Campion, how long would a fallen sister like that last here? Verse 3, I'm going out to fish. We'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat. But that night, they caught how much? They got nothing. The moon is in its final quarter. Silver, shimmery trail that leads to the moon in the distance. Placid Lake Galilee. It's a beautiful, one of those picture-perfect nights. But as it often happens, when a man fails morally, he oftentimes fails professionally. Somehow, they just, just, just all get balled up together. No fish. All night. The worst of the worst for a guy who's thinking, I guess I'll spend the rest of my life fishing. You lose. You lose again. Early in the morning, Verse 4, 
Jesus stood on the shore. Oh, I wish we had a, I wish we had a YouTube of this. I, this YouTube would be played 10,000 times by the time we're through. Wouldn't it be something? You have the camera just zooming in, early dawn light. A lone shadowy figure, far away, far enough away from the boat that nobody recognizes him. Man, if this were, where we're on the YouTube, we'd put it on the big screen right now. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? Nope. The answer echoes back across the waters to the shore. He said, throw your net out on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. And when they did, have you ever gone fishing, by the way? Am I talking to a group that has gone fishing? <laughs> have you guys gone fishing? You haven't? I mean, just the kind where you, you, know, you just, just throw a hook over? There is something electric. I'm not a big fisherman, but I've gone fishing. There is something electric when that little bobber, that little bobber, goes, and in your hands, you feel the electronic force of that tug, and you're, it's, you suddenly go, they're not fishing with bobbers. They're fishing with nets. There are a bunch of boys who've just obeyed this stranger on the shore, and they pull these soggy waterlogged nets out of the water and throw them in on this side. All right, guys, humor the stranger. Everybody hold your end. They're holding their ends when suddenly, electricity, as that net about to burst begins to pull the gunnels down. Oh, we should have had that on YouTube. <laughs> then, then the disciple, then the disciple whom Jesus loved, who'd that be? John. That John boy. Then the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer, outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. I, I have always had a hard time with that text. I mean, come on. I understand being naked fishing with just a bunch of boys. I mean, it's like the Academy Dormitory here. I mean, it's, you know, it's just life. But I can't, oh, I'm sorry, it's not life at Campion. I see a lot of heads going, no, 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 it's not. no, don't you say that about Campion. Okay, okay, okay. Times have changed because we had communal showers in college and in Academy when I went to school. They're probably illegal now, communal showers. I would imagine. Mickey, are they illegal now? No, Mickey's not even sure. He's just looking around. All right. <laughs> anyway, you know, I've never been able to figure out, so why would Peter put his clothes on and then jump in the water? I mean, I would have jumped in the water. I'd hold my clothes over my head. I've learned how to swim since a toddler. So I just hold them up and I go like this, right? I have my, wet, my dry clothes above my head. As soon as I get to the edge of the water, I'd stop, push, put them on. But Jewish, Jewish tradition was very clear. A disciple would never appear in the presence of his master naked. He would always be clothed. You see, Peter is still hoping against hope that this man is still master. Just maybe, just maybe, I haven't been rejected forever. And he puts his clothes on just in case. Wow. Will he be disappointed? Keep reading. He had taken his clothes off, and he jumped into the water. Verse 8, and the other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about 100 yards. And verse 9, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Good night. Whoever the stranger is, he has started a fire. He has, he has bread. He has fish. How did he get fish? He's not a fisherman. He's the Lord of fish. That's how he got them. And Jesus said to them, I love this, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. He could have said, hey, listen, guys, you'll learn how to fish one day. I did this. No, 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 no. You just caught the fish. You have a part, disciple and master, together. 
And so Simon Peter climbs back into the boat, verse 11, and dragged the net ashore. And by the way, this is a huge tacit admission that Simon Peter was a well-built and very strong man of man. In fact, John Boy knew Peter from a boy up. They were competitive. They always appear together in the book of Acts and John. They're always appearing together. They were buds. But clearly, Peter was the bigger, stronger one, which is why in John Boy, when he writes the story of the resurrection, he is very careful to point out they both began running at the same time toward the empty tomb. But the disciple Jesus loved got there first. <laughs> but he doesn't mass this over. This is a big fisherman, the man among men. And Peter drags the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. The specificity of that number is to guarantee that the story, the narrative is factual. Not 1,000, not 10. We counted them, 153. But even so, with many, that many, the net was not torn. Whoa, what's up with that? Verse 12, and Jesus said to them, come on, guys, let's have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Oh, see that YouTube? Can you see him reaching to the fire? Can you see him pulling that baked bread up? Can you see him handing it, nail-scarred hand, to feed them? This now, verse 14 was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised. Night number one, he appears, Thomas is not there. Night number two, Thomas is there. This is number three. And when they had finished eating, the record, it really ought to read like this. And when they were finished eating, it was time for a resurrection. Because that's what's about to happen. There's going to be a resurrection. And Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? Peter looks up, his eyes fill with tears. He can't even look Jesus in the eye for long. He looks down and he says, Lord, yes, you know that I love you. Hmm. Good, Jesus said, feed my lambs. A few moments later, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter's eyes brimming now with tears, his lower lip quivering, looks into Jesus' eyes for a moment, then drops his gaze. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, good. Take care of my sheep. And the third time Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Three times in front of the onlooking world, you declared you didn't even know me. Three times I'm asking you in front of the onlooking universe, do you really love me? And Simon, it says here, Peter was hurt. Wouldn't you be hurt? Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, good, feed my sheep. Verily, very truly I tell you, this is the last time in John's fourth gospel he, he will use a unique literary device used by no other writer in either the Old or the New Testament. He has created a device where he takes the word amen and he repeats it so that it reads amen, amen. The Greek word amen means let it be so. Amen, amen. When John uses that double, that couplet of amen, he's saying to the reader, slow down, slow down, slow down. You're going too fast. Slow down. Something huge is about to be spoken. You need to get this. Shh. Read slowly now. This is the last one. Amen, amen. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. 
But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, what did he say? Come on, you tell me, what did he say? It's what a master says to his disciple. You had any questions, Peter, about you and me? No more. I'm the master. You're my man. You are my disciple. I'm telling you, boy. Follow me. Follow me. The resurrection has just taken place, and we watched it happen. Wow. Let me ask you a question. Jesus asked Peter three. Let's consider a question or two. What does a fallen man have to go through in this area? in order for the adjective fallen to be dropped from being attached to his name. What does a fallen woman have to go through in this area in order for the collective people to drop the fallen in front of the name? Well, what do you have to do? What do you have to say? Is there a little procedure you got to go through so that everyone says, okay, we'll drop it. Okay, 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 we'll drop it. Huh? What does it take? How long do people remain fallen? Question number two. Huh? You tell me. How long do people remain fallen? There's a concept. Until they're forgiven, someone calls out. I wonder how long that takes. Oh, were you talking about God forgiving or people forgiving? Oh, big difference, isn't there? Well, we know how fast God forgives. And by the way, I'm not talking about when fallen drops off of God's record. I'm talking about our record. When does fallen fall away? No more. You say, well, do I really? It, it, it just depends on if that person is really sorry or not. Oh, really? Well, who's to determine that? I suppose the Lord Jesus could tell. Does there ever come a time when I am not my brother's keeper? Does there ever come a time when I am not my brother, my, my sister's keeper? Does there ever come a time? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his wonderful little book, Life Together, makes a very disturbing observation. I understand you're getting ready to form some grow groups around here. Well, I like that thought. We got him a pioneer, too. It's a great idea. Hmm. Who gets to be in the group? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, let's put his words on the screen here. He who is alone, she who is alone with his sin, with her sin, is utterly alone. Now, you know what we think when we read that? I know what I thought the first time I read it. Ah, he's talking about my fallen brother. He's talking about my fallen, fallen sister. <laughs> no, he's not. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. When I'm alone with my sin, I'm truly alone. Hmm. He who is alone with his sin is utterly alone. It may be that Christians, notwithstanding corporate worship, common prayer, and all their fellowship and service may be left in their loneliness. They may even come out on a Thursday night, but they're still lonely. What's the next? The pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. So everybody must conceal her sin, his sin from himself and from the fellowship. We dare not to be sinners. Keep reading. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered among the righteous. How did he get in here? How did she get in here? Please. Who wasn't watching the door? 
my, horrified. Keep reading. So we remain alone with our sin, living in lies and hypocrisy. The fact is that we are sinners. Could it be? Friends in Campion, new friends at Campion, could it be? The reason we are so hard on the fallen is because the fallen remind of us, they remind us of ourselves and we are hard on ourselves. Because the fellowship of the pious, how did that go? Permits no one to be a sinner. You can't be a sinner. So you gotta hide it. You gotta wear that mask that always says, when they ask you, how you doing? The mask is automatically trained, fine, thank you, and you? You're never telling anybody how you're really doing. You can't. Because if they find out that the truth about you is just like the truth about them and you have ostracized them because they remind you of you, they'll do the same to you. So everybody wears a mask. The pious fellowship cannot allow for sinners. So we simply don't admit that we struggle in our walk with Jesus. We don't admit that we stumble and fall. <laughs> We're not allowed to admit because we have to keep up appearances. And who's the loneliest of them all? The man with the mask. The woman with the mask. That's Bonhoeffer's point. How can, how can we talk about, hey, we're going to grow community around here, folks. Sign up. Sign up tonight when you leave. Well, I love the idea. And if I were here, I'd be signing up tonight before I left. But how can I risk getting close to you in community because you may find out what I've been hiding all along and then you won't love me? You won't love me, just like I wouldn't love you if I knew the truth about you. He who, Adam put it here, he who, will, who, he who is alone with his sin is utterly alone, for there can be no community with masks of piety. You can't have community. And that's why it's a tragic comedy what we long for most, listen to this, what we long for most we prevent when we pretend we are not what we really are, sinners, all of us, in need of divine grace. For you see, listen, 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 listen. A graceless community is an oxymoron. Do you know what an oxymoron is? It's two mutually exclusive words. You can't have, you can't have grace in a community where everybody is living with a mask. It just can't be. You know why? Because only grace can resurrect community. Until I know how Jesus thinks of me, I can never treat you like Jesus treats me because I never give him the chance. I'm wearing a mask with him and I'm pretending that I have it all together. A graceless community is an oxymoron until there must be a reason why in every calendar that I've seen, Good Friday precedes Resurrection Sunday. Isn't that right? You can't have Easter Sunday before you have Good Friday. Having a dead Savior is good news, but having a risen Savior is dangerous news because of what Jesus did, just did with Peter. A bold, flagrant sinner like that with three questions. Come on. Follow me. Until I experience the grace of Good Friday myself, I will never grant you the grace for you to be yourself. 
I have to be at the cross first. Then comes the resurrection. Yeah. That's how grace works. With its doors thrown wide open to all. And by the way, that's the only way community works. With its doors thrown wide open to all. If you're trying to have community and you're keeping him out and her out and them away, you don't have community. You have pious fellowship. And I hope you enjoy it. Only grace can resurrect community. I want to end with two stories. I'm going to tell you the, I'm going to tell you the first story, but because you won't believe the first story, I have to tell you the second. I'm sorry, but that's just the way it works. So first, let me tell you the story that you're going to say, ah, psh, not true. It's okay. I'm going to read it. Perhaps the, the, the writer pens. Perhaps you've heard this story. Stop me if you have. Perhaps you've heard this story. Four years ago in a large city in the far west. Is Denver far west? So it's not a story. We know now it's not a story from Denver. Four years ago in a large city in the far west, rumors spread that a certain Catholic woman was having visions of Jesus. Ooh. The reports reached the archbishop. He decided to check her out. There's always a fine line between authentic mystic and the lunatic fringe. Is it true, ma'am, that you have visions of Jesus, asked the cleric. Yes, the woman replied simply. Well, the next time you have a vision, I want you to ask Jesus to tell you the sins that I confess in my last confession. Understood? The woman was stunned. Did I hear you right, Bishop? You actually want me to ask Jesus to, t to tell me the sins of your past? Exactly. And please call me when you have an answer. Ten days later, the woman notified her spiritual leader of a recent vision. Please come, she said. Within the hour the archbishop arrived, he trusted eye-to-eye -eye contact. You just told me on the telephone that you actually had a vision of Jesus. Did you do what I asked you to do? Yes, Bishop. I asked Jesus to tell me the sins you confessed in your last confession. The bishop leaned forward with anticipation. His eyes narrowed. And what did he say? The woman took his hand and gazed deeply into his eyes. Bishop, she said, these are his exact words. I can't remember. Oh, that's just an apocryphal story. <laughs> that, that, that's not the way God operates. <sighs> story number two. Open your Bible, please, to 1 Kings chapter 14. I want you to never forget after tonight that the verses you are about to read, the words you are about to read, are, have been in your Bible from the beginning of Holy Scripture. 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings. King David is dead. Another king has arisen to the throne. The other king is a bad king. God sends a message to the bad king. And here's the message. 1 Kings chapter 14. Drop down, please, to verse 8. The message to the bad king goes like this, verse 8. Hey, king, I tore the kingdom away from the house of David, and I gave it to you, but you have not been like my servant David. Here it goes now. You have not been like my servant David, number one, who kept my commands. Whoa, time out, time out. Stop right there, stop right there. God, please. Now, what are you saying? You're talking about the David, the David that, that, that climbed up on the roof and he looked over the roof and there's Bathsheba having a bath. You're talking about that David or is there another David that we don't know about? 
Because if you're talking about the David that climbed up onto the roof and looked down that spring, spring evening and saw a woman bathing in, her own, in the privacy of her own backyard, I want to tell you something, God. He not only broke the first commandment, the second, the third, and the fourth, he broke all ten by the time he's through because he commits adultery in his mind, that's coveting, then he commits it actually, that's the real thing. And then he steals what doesn't belong to him. And then he lies to cover up his stealing. And he dishonors his father and the mother. He has other gods in front of him. He doesn't keep the Sabbath. He is told, he broke all your commandments. So let's just slow down, God. You get a little excited here. Tell us again about this David. God says, would you quit interrupting me? I will. I'll repeat what I just said. You have not been like my servant David, who, number one, kept my commandments. May I go on? Yes, please. And number two, followed me with all his heart. Stop, stop, time out again, time. God. He followed you with all his heart. Are you serious? All his heart? He gave his heart to a woman that wasn't even his wife. What do you mean? He followed you with all his heart. You are something else. A little bit of divine dementia. That's what we have on our hands. God says, are you through? Because I'm not. Verse 8. But you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments, one. Two, who followed me with all his heart. And three, did only what is right in my eyes. Stop. Alzheimer's, that's what you have. Only did what was right in my eyes. You, you can't mean King David, but he means King David. What's going on here? I can't remember. He's lost the capacity to recall. What's going on here? Ladies and gentlemen, it's called the gospel. The gospel. I'm not making this stuff up. A little classic called Steps to Christ on the screen right now. If you give yourself to Jesus and you accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been for his sake, you are accepted before God. Read those last words out loud with me. Just as if you had not what? As if you had not sinned. He did only, she did only what was right in my life. There are some friends of mine in my own faith community who have this trepidation, and that's why they find the, the, the Bible teaching of the judgment such bad news because they're absolutely certain that when you get to the, your actual appointment before the judgment bar of God, and Paul does say in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we shall all stand before the judgment bar of God, that when, that when they call your name on that day, you will suddenly remember there was one sin I I did not let go of. There was one sin I forgot to say I'm sorry for, and I'll be lost forever. David went to the judgment, because if you die before Jesus comes, you go to the judgment. I mean, it's over. The book is closed. Finis. And post-judgment, the judge of the universe said, I want to tell you about my friend David, who kept all my commandments, Followed me with all his heart and only do, did what was right. That's the David that stands in the judgment before the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you accept him as your Savior, then sinful as your life may have been, whether you're David or you, for God's sake you are accepted before him just as if you had not sinned. You can't make this stuff up, folks. It's the everlasting gospel, and it's always been true, and it'll be true when you come to your last breath. Whether you are 18 years old or 88 years old, it does not matter. It will be true when you breathe your last breath. You are safe in the nail-scarred hands of your Savior. But he's not just your savior. He's your dangerous Lord who will take you as you are, but will never leave you as you are. 
It's all Jesus. By faith. That's why they call it the gospel, which means very good news. So if that's the way God treats us, I guess it's a no-brainer to wonder out loud, maybe we should treat each other the same way. The very same way. There are people all over this community who once sat in a pew like this somewhere, but have long since wandered away. They don't miss me. Nobody even knows I'm alive. They haven't come and knocked on my door. Nobody's even called me. We could fill this church twice over in this little neighborhood of Loveland if this good news could get to them via a loving human messenger. That's what it takes. Not a grouchy human messenger, a loving human messenger who says, I have always been my brother's keeper, and you, my friend, are my brother. Come on. Come to the family with me. Let's spend a Sabbath together. You'll love it. We're different now. We've changed. We've got the gospel. And that's why I'm loving, I'm loving on you right now. That's the gospel truth. And I want it to be the truth in my life and heart. And I want it to be the truth in your life and heart. Don't you? I mean, how many want to say with me, hey, listen, Dwight, yeah, I, I want to send this to Jesus, Dwight. Uh, I'll join you in putting up in my hand, and I'm saying by this, Jesus, I want you to make me into your likeness. I want to love people this way. I want to be a community builder just like you. The way you treated Peter, that was beautiful. How did you think of that? Let me learn how to do the same, Lord Jesus. Let me learn how to do the same. Oh, Jesus, the truth of Calvary explodes out of that empty tomb on Sunday. The Lord of the Sabbath is the Lord of salvation, is the Lord of community, is the Lord who said, hey, do you love me? Hey, Peter, Peter, I'm, I'm talking to you. And the Peter who couldn't raise his eyes, tears, trickling down that strong man's cheeks, said, oh, Lord Jesus, you know my heart. I want to come back. I want to come back to you. Of course I love you. The Jesus who said to that Peter, follow me, is the Jesus who is ready to say that to every man, woman, and teenager in this space right now. You may have done something somewhere, sometime, that is still a dark memory in your conscience. And it's holding you back from the fullness of a life, of a coming alive kind of life with Jesus. And my friend, I don't know who you are, you don't know who I am, and I'll be gone in a few hours, and life goes on. But you're not here tonight by accident. Somebody invited you. You came. You're here. Here's what I know. Whatever it is that is in your past, what I know is it's past. And the Jesus who can re summarize David's life at, after he's dead and gone is the same Jesus who can summarize your life while you are alive and well right now. just as if you had never sinned. You say, hey, come on, girl. Come on, boy. Don't play the tough guy. Just tell me you want a friendship with me, and I'll give you that friendship, boy. I know that everything in your heart wants to be the popular, the most popular guy on this campus. I know that feeling. I have lived by it, too. But I need you to be a leader for me.
I need you to stand up for me. I need you to ask me to be your friend. And then I'll take you. I don't care what happened yesterday. I don't care what happened this summer. I don't care at all. I'll take you as you are right now. And I will make you a champion for me as Peter became. I just need you to say yes to me. You have no tough guy image you have to live up to. Girl, I'm talking about you. I need you to let me have your heart. You're giving it to everybody you can think of in hopes that that will make you loved and accepted. That won't make you loved and accepted. You got to give your heart away, but you got to give it to me. I need you to be a force around this place. You got the potential, girl. Don't blow your chance. I'm talking to you, and you hear me. Say yes to me. Same Jesus. Same promise. You want to give your heart to that Jesus? You want to follow him? Yeah, me too. Would you take your, uh, your, your card that they handed to you at the door? A little decision card. Got mine here somewhere. Here's what I'd like to do. I want to look at these three boxes again. But I want to give you an opportunity to respond beyond the card. That'd be okay? Uh, box number one, I want to prepare for baptism. Look at what we just saw happening with Jesus and Peter and Jesus and David. That's what baptism does. It just whoosh, buries that past and you have a brand new start. We had a beautiful, beautiful baptism last night. There'll be more. You not been baptized yet? Put a, put a check mark there. You're a teenager, fine. You're in your 20s, in your 40s. You might be in your 70s. It doesn't matter. It's not the age thing. It's, it's the letting Jesus take your life thing. You put a check mark right there. Make sure we have a, a, a name and best way to contact you. Email address or a cell phone would be perfect. Somebody will be in touch with you. You want some information on joining a grow group? Now we can talk community because what community is about is authentic transparency. Community isn't a bunch of people playing ping pong who are just wearing their masks. Community is people playing ping pong who are being real people with each other because every grow group has these five DNAs in it. Number one, it's a shared activity that we all love. And oh boy, Pastor Michael just, Pastor Michael, your grow group discipleship pastor just gave me this. You got an incredible lineup. Have they already handed this out to you yet? And when you get to the back, just make sure you get this menu. This is what's lined up. When did, when did these start? How many weeks from, how many days from now? Next week, you sign up for one of these. You got an incredible, just read the list through. This is, this is, a, this is marvelous. You pick a group that's your interest. You'll be with five, 10, maybe 15 at the most individuals who have the same common bond. So DNA, common interest, a little bit of the Bible is, takes place in that group. There'll be time for prayer. Every group has a service project so that we don't just entertain ourselves, and every group will have a social night. That's, that's grow groups the world over. Every group will have a night when we just party together. It's a wonderful community building, friendship growing. You kids will be with a circle of strangers. There are people in that like stamp collecting that you never knew before, but you're going to be in the same group, and you're going to like each other just because you like the same things in life. So this is a wonderful community. But what we've talked about tonight is how that community can be real and just grow. And we got grow groups that go way beyond grow groups. They just keep this fellowship going and going and going. And that's the whole joy and mission of Jesus' kingdom. So put a check mark there. You'd like to, information on joining a grow group. But don't miss a table. There'll be a table out there. You can sign up tonight. Pick your, pick your grow group and sign up. Uh, box number three, I want to know more about coming alive in my relationship with Jesus. I want to come alive in my relationship with Jesus. I know you want that, and I do too. So let's do this tonight. I'm calling an audible right now. Pastor Nestor, if that's okay. Let's get the group up here. I want to sing that. I love that theme song, and I want to hear it one more time before, before I leave. But while the group is coming up here, would you mind bringing this card with you? Let's just come up here. Let's, just, let's have a little community right up here. We'll have, a, we'll have a final prayer together, and then we're gone. But would you come forward? Bring your... Bring your your uh, decision card with you, and they're going to just uh, receive them from us as we're standing here at the front. 
So I'll just take some of you. Yeah, the ushers come and he's saying, if you didn't get a card, raise your hand. But uh, those of you who are sitting, would you mind just standing up and just coming right here into the aisle? Let's just, let's just have a come alive moment, us together, as a, as a community tonight in worship. There you go. Yeah, go ahead, come on up, come on up this way. It just takes a few brave souls and then people finally get it. Oh, is this for everybody? Yeah, it's for everybody. You're a student at the academy, come on up. You're somebody that lives out in the community, come on up. Nobody's taking names here. We're just coming forward. But bring this card with you because our ushers will be right up here and we'll just give, our, give the cards to them as we head out of here in a moment. So whether you filled the card out or not, would you mind just coming forward and we'll have this, uh, this community moment together. There you go. Come up the sides as well. Yeah, we'll get everybody up here eventually. And if there's, they're too full in front of you now, then just step out into the aisle. Just pull into the aisle and then we'll sing this Come Alive song and celebrate the community that our Lord Jesus brings to us, our dangerous Lord brings to us tonight. If you're sitting there on the edge, just, just pull over, pull into that side. If you guys, come on up. Just follow up. All of those who are coming up beside you. And if you can't get out, stand up where you are then. Just stand where you are if you can't get out of the aisle now. And Esther, you lead us. Lead us, please. Through the eyes of men sees there's so much we have lost. It's me the down the road where all the prodigals have God, that's our prayer. We stand shoulder to shoulder, person to person. We are your children, but we are your friends. Dry bones and dead hearts. 
the past gone. If anyone is in Christ, she, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. There's somebody standing beside us right now who's just made a decision to be baptized. Father, be with him. Be with her. Oh, there's somebody that doesn't want her to have that new beginning. There's somebody that doesn't want him to have a fresh start. Rebuke the enemy, Father. And may the sweet spirit of Christ himself breathe into this heart tonight the assurance you made the right choice. I accept it. Together, we write a brand new future. There are many who have put a check mark. I want to be a part of that grow group experience. Oh, Father, make it the community, not of pious fellowship, but the community of genuine grace and love, genuine friendship. I care about you. You care about me. And we'll journey a few weeks together. And we'll all be the better for it. Father, grow this faith community through grow groups. We all want to come alive. So have at it. The best is yet to come because Jesus is coming soon. Have at it. Come alive, we will, by your grace, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Let all the friends of Jesus say, Amen and Amen. Those cards that you brought forward, do you mind just coming by our ushers? Maybe you've already turned them in. I see cards in hands actually at the back door. Okay, the ushers are at the back door. They'll receive the cards from you there. That's perfect. Pastor Michael, anything you want to say to the... Okay. God be with you till we meet again.